introductions. Um, I want to introduce Professor Joseph A. Stramondo, who I'm, I'm going to do something slightly atypical here. Usually we just say, you know, so-and-so got their PhD from such and such a place in such and such a year. And, but, but since Joe and I actually share an alma mater, I have to kind of, you know, I have to actually stop and say, so, so Joe Stromato got his, his bachelor's from Trinity College in Hartford, Connecticut, where I also went um, in 2004. I'm a little older, but I'm not going to say how much older <laughs> um, because I don't want to admit that. You know, publicly, if I could possibly help it. Um, he also got his master's from Trinity in public policy studies, and then went on to do a PhD in philosophy at Michigan State University, which he completed in 2014. Um, his research happens largely at the intersection of clinical ethics. So that's the, the big philosophy part of this, right, is, is um, clinical healthcare ethics, um, public policy, and disability studies. And he's sort of uniquely kind of positioned in a lot of ways to sort of work on those areas. Um, he teaches, he is, in fact, you're a assistant teaching professor. Am I getting this right? Okay, okay I'm working on it. At, in the Department of Administration, or is it Healthcare Administration? Health Administration. Health Administration. See, this is what happens when you try to write things on an iPhone. It all goes out the window. Um, Department of Health Administration at Drexel University's School of Nursing and Health Professions. This, for those of you who are philosophy majors, you know, you don't have to sort of, you know, stay in philosophy. You can even get a PhD in philosophy and sort of work in a lot of, it, it sets you up to work a lot of different places. Um, and this is a really good place for someone to do the kind of work that Joe does, too. So it really works perfectly. Um, and today, Joe is going to present us a paper entitled, and I, I'm cheating off the poster because it's long, um, Disabled by Design. Justifying and limiting parental authority to choose future children with pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. And I'd like to welcome Joe and Thank you. Thank you. So Ed might be a bit chronologically older, but he has a much younger hairline than I do, so I'm gonna keep my hat on, if that's okay. Um anyway. Um, before I get going with, uh, with my talk, um, I realized as I was driving across the bridge from Philly that I never actually explain what pre-implantation genetic diagnosis is in my paper. Um, and so I figured, uh, you know, everybody might not be on the same page as far as the technology goes. Um, and so I would uh, spend a couple seconds just explaining that before I get into the, the uh, philosophically technical piece, okay? Um, so... <coughs> Pre-implantation genetic di <coughs> diagnosis, sorry, um, or what I uh, refer to um, as PGD um, in the paper, um, is a way of uh, selecting um, embryos, basically. And so the way it works is it works in tandem with um, in vitro fertilization, which is probably something you all have heard of at one time or another, where you uh, fertilize um, the, uh, the egg outside of a woman's uterus, um, create a bunch of embryos, and then pick which one you want, and then implant that into the uterus to have the, the resulting uh, child. Um, and so that's just sort of the, the very uh, quick and dirty uh, explanation of what PGD is before I get into things. OK. <coughs> so um, like any philosophically interesting healthcare practice, Ethical analysis of pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, or PGD, has produced a wide range of moral positions. For example, one might contrast David King's view that warns PGD should <coughs> be strictly limited and regulated because it will soon result in the expansion of a troubling laissez-faire eugenics um, with Julian Sevlescu's argument for the principle of procreative beneficence which would morally require parents to use information um, attained through PGD to select what he refers to as the best child, okay? <coughs> so that is, these authors represent two poles of a sort of moral spectrum regarding PGD. At one end, we have a deep suspicion of the technology um, as directly leading to a sort of eugenics, um, which is assumed to be a negative consequence by, by that camp. And then at the other end of the spectrum, we have a vigorous enthusiasm for the technology um, as a means toward creating better offspring, um, where better is taken to mean 
uh, biologically functioning at or above the level of species normal or species typical functioning. Okay. For my part, I sort of uh, askew both of these positions and attempt to break this dichotomy open by maintaining that future parents are not morally required to use PGD to select sort of the best, objectively best child, but should be permitted to use PGD to select embryos according to their own conception of the good life, um, even if that conception of the good life includes a motive function that is species abnormal or species atypical. Okay. Um, so, in other words, um, select for disability. Okay. So, however, I would not argue that any use of PGD to select a future child is morally permissible. And so we need some way um, of identifying which conceptions of the good life ought to be allowed to motivate uh, prenatal selection without defaulting to this flawed concept, what I think of as a flawed concept of normal function, um, as this convenient measuring stick. Okay? So to achieve this, I will first uh, invite moral judgments um, regarding a future child's likely range of opportunity that would result from her parents acting according to their conception of the good life. Okay. <coughs> However, I reject the notion that this opportunity range should itself be defined only in terms of species normal functioning, um, as it often is, so as to be considered equal or normal. Instead, um, I try to uh, advocate for an acceptable opportunity range, which should include a variety of modes of functioning, which can contribute to a broad enough opportunity range if they are reasonably accommodated. Okay? So this notion of reasonable accommodation, as it has been developed in the Americans with Disabilities Act, I hope will help parse between uses of PGD that ought to be accepted and those that should be outside the scope of parental decision-making authority. Further, by deploying the notion of reasonable accommodation to provide boundaries to the acceptable use of PGD, um, would not sanction the sort of laissez-faire eugenics that King is worried about, because it would leave room for policy interventions suggested by disability advocates looking to challenge reproductive decisions based on harmful stigma and stereotype. Um, likewise, my position abandons species normal functioning as necessary condition for an acceptable opportunity range, and so it would expand the range of reproductive choice by providing parents with much more flexibility in defining which embryos are suitable for selection. In summary, this paper attempts to carve out a position that acknowledges the danger of PGD, encouraging simplistic, stigma-based reproductive decision-making, while also justifying parents' use of PGD to choose embryos that will help uh, or that will develop into children with and without disabilities um, who will flourish in the context in which they are raised. <coughs> so for the structure of the paper, I will begin by um, saying a few words uh, that hopefully philosophically ground um, just sort of a general presumption of parental decision-making authority regarding PGD by extending arguments for parental surrogate decision-making in general. Um, and then I will offer an argument for limiting this prima facie parental decision-making authority by evaluating a future child's opportunity range with the standard of reasonable accommodation, rather than conflating the notion of acceptable opportunity range with this normal species function, as is often done. So and then I'll conclude basically by just arguing that my position is entirely compatible with both the goals of preventing unreflective reproductive decisions based on harmful social stigmas and per permitting the thoughtful use of PGD by potential parents to improve their future child's well-being while not requiring that they do so as someone li like Sivilescu might. <coughs> okay, so that was the introduction. The next section is called Grounding a Prima Fascia Parental Authority to Make PGD Decisions. Currently, there is a widespread philosophical and popular consensus that other things being equal, parents ought to employ or enjoy broad decision-making authority to make major life decisions for their incompetent children. Okay? Now, the word incompetent here um, isn't um, sort of meant to mean like, oh, you're, you're incompetent at, I don't know, uh, driving a car or something like that, right? Um, you're a bad driver, no. Incompetent here is, is being used um, in the technical bioethical sense to just mean not able to make decisions for themselves, okay? 
So in this section, I will summarize what I take to be a series of common, powerful arguments grounding parental um, authority, and then extend these arguments to applications affecting the fates of potential children um, treated via in vitro fertilization and PGD. Okay. Um, so, so basically, I just sort of first talk about um, arguments for why parents have the authority to make decisions for their kids, um, and then I'll talk about why these same sorts of arguments would uh, apply to future kids with um, in vitro fertilization and PGD. So as a starting point, I will draw on what I believe is an appropriately rigorous and sophisticated justification of parental decision-making authority that has been developed in the healthcare ethics literature on surrogate decision-making by Alan Buchanan and Dan Brock's classic, Deciding for Others. <coughs> Buchanan and Brock contend surrogate decision-making that is shared by all interested parties, including family members and healthcare professionals, is the ideal in cases of incompetence. However, an incompetent person's family should be the default principal decision maker regarding medical choices. Okay, so in other words, these choices are made um, with input from parents, children, and physicians and other healthcare professionals, but the parents are sort of where the, where the buck stops. Okay, so this is because they argue a person's family has the strongest concern for the individual's good as well as the most accurate knowledge of what is required to achieve that good, including knowledge about the incompetent patient's previously held values and preferences um, that give content to that good. Okay? And so here they're really talking about um, folks who are incompetent but that who used to be competent, right? Um, so of course this only, uh, only part of this justification retains its full force for young children, right? Um, who are incompetent to decide for themselves in no small part because they have not yet developed their own coherent values and preferences by which they might decide. So it's unintelligible to argue that a minor's family ought to be the presumptive surrogate because they have the best knowledge of that child's values and preferences um, and are hence prepared to offer a substituted judgment, right? Um, so yet even without specific knowledge of a child's unique values and preferences, which aren't yet developed, um, these reasons can still justify a presumption of parental decision-making authority, as well as a third reason that is somewhat particular to minors, um, the parents' interests in the outcome of the decision made. Okay? So when it comes to making important healthcare decisions for minors, parents ought to be presumptive surrogates for three reasons. Um, first, they tend to feel great concern toward a child's well-being, right? They, they care about the kid. Um, second, they have the most accurate knowledge of what is required for that child's well-being, okay? And then third, they hold an important stake in the consequences of that decision, okay? <coughs> so the first of these reasons seems obvious enough. Um, to be sure, some parents have knowingly committed horrific abuses against their children, and so a parent's desire to promote um, the well-being of their child is far from the sort of a priori truth, right? Um, however, it is safe to assume that most parents do have a particularly powerful sort of concern for the interests of their children um, because of the intimacy that is engendered by the child-rearing process, okay? So in fact, this is a special sort of concern that may be characterized as a form of justifiable or even laudable partiality um, that would not be exhibited by other uh, benevolent but objective third parties, right? And so the parent-child relationship creates this sort of partiality um, where, they, where they care more about their kids than someone else's kids, right? And, and that makes sense in this case, okay? So um, for example, if the well-being of a person's child was seriously threatened, it would seem morally suspect for a parent to think through the utilitarian benefits of, and harms of protecting their child or not, right? Um, I would not think a precise calculation of the overall utility of protecting her child from harm would be a parent's reaction to a serious threat. Um, this is her child, and she very rightly shows special concern for it rather than for other persons who have, may have a stake in the situation as well. Um, similarly, future parents also show special concern for the well-being of any children they plan to have. When potential parents try to conceive an embryo, with or without the use of reproductive technology, like 
IVF and PVD, they typically exhibit behaviors that display serious consideration for the well-being of that future child, right? Um, hopefully, future parents prepare themselves and their home in all sorts of ways um, in anticipation of that future child, and these preparations indicate the sort of special concern Buchanan and Brock are, are talking about and that they use to ground this prima facie parental decision authority more generally, okay? So this is my argument for how it is this special sort of concern argument extends to future children as well as uh, current children or, or existing children. Okay, so it may be objected that <coughs> mere potential children have no interests to be cared for, right? Because they don't exist yet. Um, while they're not referring to embryos, Buchanan and Brock do kind of provide a response to this criticism, parsing between a being's current interests and what they call future or forward-looking interests, okay? <coughs> they take infants themselves to be potential rather than actual persons and describe some forward-looking interests they have that seem to apply equally well to embryos, okay? So these are interests that may not be exercised by newborns at the present time, but still must be protected so that they can be satisfied later, okay? So such conditional future interests are of key importance to newborns, but also I would argue carry weight for embryos that are likely to survive to the point that they um, can be satisfied. It might be argued that the protec protection of these sorts of future-oriented interests makes it coherent to talk about a potential parent having strong concern for the well-being of an embryo that is regarded as a potential person, okay? So perhaps it might still be objected that any particular embryo in the PGD stage is so early in its development with all the variability that that entails that it's not even coherent to regard it with future-oriented uh, interests as we would a newborn, okay? Um, it might be metaphysically suspect to argue that an embryo has any interests at all, future or current, because of the great uncertainty that exists about its future. However, um, a weaker claim may actually suffice for establishing a parent's partiality toward that embryo. <coughs> <coughs> Namely, it might be argued that a parent has concern for the well-being of any child that they may have in the future, and this concern does not turn on the existence of a particular embryo as an entity, okay? So for example, um, a potential mother may try to do away with an unhealthy habit like smoking tobacco um, for the sake of any future child she may conceive in the future while she's trying to get pregnant before a, a particular embryo even exists, right? Um, and so rather than claim that a parent ought to have a prima facie surrogate decisional authority for their embryo, because of a concern for that particular embryo's current or future interests, I would argue that this can be established with a particular sort of parental concern for any child's potential future interests, okay? Or any future child's potential interests, there we go. Um, so that's my, my first reason, okay? The second reason why parents should be the default deciders for their children also enjoys uh, what I think of as almost an obvious appeal, okay? It om in almost all segments of society, a child's parents are also the default caretaker, right? Now, of course, there are exceptions to this generalization, just like the bit about impartiality, right? There's always exceptions. Um, but in the majority of cases, a child's most intimate relationship is with its parents, and so they have the most thorough knowledge of that particular child's specific needs, right? So these needs are determined um, by all sorts of things, sometimes by particular anatomical and psychological characteristics of the child or self, um, but as well as various facets of the context in which the child is being raised, okay? So this justification for a prima facie parental decision uh, making authority needs a slight reframing if it is to apply equally well to the future children produced by PGD because the intimacy does not yet exist between a parent and future potential child, so it cannot establish a parent's special knowledge of that child's specific needs, right? We don't know what the child's specific needs are going to be yet, and so um, we can't uh, use any sort of special knowledge of those specific needs uh, as justification, okay, for, for why they ought to have this authority to decide. So it is not obvious 
that parents would have a special knowledge of the projected needs of their future children, as they do uh, the current needs of their actual children. Right? However, it doesn't seem that specific accurate knowledge of what a child needs to flourish is limited to knowledge of that particular child itself. Okay? In fact, knowledge of what a child needs is also constituted by knowledge of the social, cultural, and environmental context in which that child will exist. Okay? So there are some needs a potential child will also have that are determined by these contexts, and they can be more accurately predicted by a parent who will be raising the child in that context um, than it can be predicted by others. Right? Um, for example, the broad, sophisticated knowledge of a child psychologist would tell him nothing of how likely it is a potential child will need to learn how to ice fish or navigate a complex subway system. Right? Um, so this need has little to do with the characteristic of the child itself, but is determined by the context of whether one is growing up in, if I can pronounce it right, Nunavut or Manhattan. Right? Um, so in this way, the second justification for parental decision-making authority can be understood to apply to potential as well as existing children. Um, and that, in, in that way, it comes to bear in this question of PGD. Okay. So finally, Buchanan and Brock make um, this more controversial claim that parents ought to be the default decision makers because of the stake they themselves have in the decision at hand. Okay. <coughs> Here they're not arguing that parents have unlimited authority to make any decision they like that serves their own interests at their child's great expense. Um, rather, it is maintained <coughs> excuse me, that parents ought to have at least some latitude to make decisions that take into consideration their self-interest as well as the interests of their other children. Right? So one reason for this um, is that parents responsible for dealing with the consequences um, of such decisions. And so it may be unfair, the quote here is, it may be unfair to force them to bear the consequences of the treatment choice while denying them any input into it. Okay. So correspondingly, uh, I think the, this argument applies to potential parents as well. Right? The potential parent has to deal with the emotional and material consequences of any major <coughs> decision regarding a potential child um, in, in his care, just as an actual parent would have to contend with these same consequences regarding an actual child. So by its very nature, this sort of consequentialist reasoning hinges on the prediction and evaluation of various sorts of decisional outcomes, right? Um, even when you're doing it with potential children, you're trying to predict what the outcome of a decision is likely to be, right? Um, and so such predictions and evaluations are always future-oriented and that they are always judgments of potential rather than actual outcomes, because we don't know how it's going to turn out yet, right? Um, and so it doesn't seem to diminish the strength of this argument in any way to apply it to the decisional authority of potential parents considering choices about their potential child via PGD, because it's all future-oriented in this way. <coughs> so none of these three arguments should be taken as reasons to grant parents absolute authority in making decisions for their children. Um, that's why they're prima facie reasons, right? Um, however, I do think that these arguments work as prima facie justifications for locating decisional authority with parents rather than someone else. Right? Um, if these are good reasons to assume parents are the best decision makers when it comes to their children's well-being, then we must try to construct coherent ethical boundaries to that decisional authority. Um, the remainder of this essay will attempt to establish such boundaries for potential parents um, as they make decisions about the well-being of their future children with PGD technology. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. So, um, redefining the limits of parental decisional authority over their future children. So, the above arguments are for a presumpt presumption of parental authority to make important decisions for their future children, some of whom will be conceived through IVF and PGD. But there are surely some such decisions parents might make that are outside the acceptable scope of, of moral boundaries, right? Um, the boundaries of parental decisional 
authority over actual children have been drawn by statute and case law, um, and we recognize deviance from those boundaries as abuse or neglect, right? Um, so nonetheless, it is not nearly as clear where these, bo these boundaries are regarding future potential children, right? Um, this is a, a newer kind of way of thinking. Um, so perhaps the limit of potential decisional authority over future children should be understood as a matter of balancing benefit and harm, okay? Because that's kind of how it's done um, right now with, with actual children, right? Um, but, of course, there's a wrinkle. <laughs> Derek Parfit famously frames this question of harm to potential persons via genetic impairment as what he calls the non-identity problem, okay? So he argues in cases where technology allows us to avoid an impairment for a potential person only by eliminating the existence of that potential person, it cannot be said that the resulting actual person is harmed by their impairment unless the existence is itself a harm, okay? That was sort of a lot of words strung together. Hopefully you kind of followed along. Um, in other words, the non-identity problem points out so long as a person's life with a genetic impairment is worth living on balance, even if other people without that impairment have an easier time of it, the so impaired person cannot claim that they are harmed by the impairment because the only way such harm could have been avoided would have been to not create them in the first place, right? And so that's kind of what we're talking about with PGD. So thus, if we are to rely on the concept of harm to future potential persons to set the boundaries of parental authority, the non-identity problem would find any choice acceptable so long as the resulting life is not so burdened by suffering that it is not worth living, okay? Um, of course, this seems like a really low bar, right? Um, for parents to meet when their reproductive choices are going to impact the life of their future children. Um, it would seem really counterintuitive um, that all else being equal, this parental decision authority to use PGD is justified in part because parents care so deeply for their children and yet um, then allow for any such decision resulting in any amount of suffering to a future child up to the point that their child's life is not worth living, right? So uh, I, I really care about you and therefore I'm going to uh, treat you in such a way that you might suffer a whole lot, but don't worry, it's, it's better than being dead, right? Um, so that, that seems a, a little bit odd, right? So um, instead of using uh, sort of the, the life worth living kind of uh, standard, I would suggest that we just sort of jettison the concept of harm to a specific person as useful for this boundary setting portion of the project and instead turn to the thought of Norman Daniels, along with some guidance from the Americans with Disabilities Act, to equip us for this task of uh, project the, I'm sorry, for this task of protecting a future range, uh, a range of future opportunities for a potential child. Okay, getting back on track here. <coughs> that is to say, um, Daniels' philosophical notion of a normal opportunity range has been applied to future persons in his, uh, in, or in the enormously influential book that he co-authored called From Chance to Choice, okay? Um, and I think that this can be amended and improved with the disability rights legal concept of reasonable accommodation so that it provides a viable alternative to just relying merely on a concept of harm that is defined by normal function, okay? So, I'm gonna take a break and take a sip of water. While Daniels is not usually explicitly drawing um, this moral boundary for PGD when he lays out his uh, theory of healthcare justice, this theory, I think, is a good starting point for crafting such a boundary because of the important connections he highlights between an individual's health and their access to social goods, okay? These are just the sort of future-oriented interests that should be preserved when making PGD decisions, okay? So in Just Health, um, another one of Daniels' books, um, he argues that health has special moral importance because it preserves an individual's what he calls normal opportunity range, okay? 
So drawing on Rawls's notion of fair equality of opportunity, Daniels reasons that if we believe that individuals should enjoy a fair share of the normal opportunity range, we want to correct for special disadvantages that have le led to the misdevelopment or underdevelopment of talents or skills. <coughs> Daniels goes on to extend Rawls's argument by asserting inequality in health is just one of these special disadvantages um, we should correct in order to protect the uh, individual's fair equality of opportunity. Okay, so this is his justification for why uh, we we um, sort of have just dessert, right? Why we deserve health care, okay, um, as as a, as a right. Um, for Daniels, health is a necessary condition for normal opportunity range, which he takes as the practical content of a fair uh, equality of opportunity, okay? And so if you, if you look at fair equality of opportunity, he says that um, when it comes to, to healthcare, what we're really talking about is this normal opportunity range, right? What you are able to do. So Daniels further clarifies his position by following Borse um, in defining health as normal functioning for our species, okay? So thus, Daniels basically inextricably binds normal function for our species to his notion of normal opportunity range, okay? Now this is really important because Borse claims that normal species functioning or species typical functioning is this sort of value-free thing that he uses to define what health is, right? So Daniels takes that and then smuggles in all this value, right? Um, so his argument is simply that we have a responsibility to maintain the normal functioning of individuals in order to maintain their fair share of the normal opportunity range. He basically is arguing here that a normal opportunity range is a necessary but not sufficient, oh wait, I'm sorry, that species typical functioning is a necessary but not sufficient condition for normal opportunity range, right? You have to be healthy in Borsian terms in order to participate in society, right? Um, I would argue that a modified version of Daniels's notion of normal opportunity range um, should limit parental authority to decide the characteristics of their children with PGD. That is, deliberately selecting embryos that will not develop into persons that have an acceptable range of life opportunities should be outside the range of morally acceptable uses of PGD. However, it does not follow that PGD can only be used to implant embryos with normal species functioning. Okay, um, so the idea in general that we ought to not implant embryos that are going to have um, lives that uh, are going to have really narrow opportunity ranges um, is, is probably a good one, right? But we don't want to just sort of conflate this thing about normal species functioning with what it means to have an acceptable range of opportunities, okay? <coughs> so this is because Daniels, I think, makes what is a mistake by positing a normal opportunity range um, and, and defining it exclusively in terms of normal species functioning, okay? <coughs> in a book chapter by Ron Amundsen called Disability, Ideology, and Quality of Life, A Bias in Biomedical Ethics, uh, Amundsen argues that even if Borse correctly defines health as statistically normal species functioning, it does not follow that normal species functioning is either necessary or sufficient for ac accessing an acceptable range of life opportunities, okay? Instead, Amundsen argues, this is kind of a, a big chunk of text here that I am borrowing, um, the opportunities lost to impaired people come from environmental design, not from biology itself. And so the notion that discriminatory barriers to opportunity are unavoidable facts of nature is no more justified in the case of disability than it would be in, case, in the case of racial or sex discrimination. Okay, and so he's trying to argue by analogy here, which is kind of controversial. I don't know if I always agree with that tactic, but um, for kind of trying to explain what he's trying to do, it's kind of useful, I think. So, of course, Amundsen admits that disabilities entail a degree of biological impairment, right? Um, but he argues that Daniels is performing an obfuscation, I can never say that word right, um, by defining opportunity in such narrow terms. Um, because whether impairments restrict employment, the freedom to live where one chooses, 
or one's social status depends on the social structures in which they are embedded. Right? It's not sort of inevitable that if you have an impairment, you're going to be at a disadvantage. This is contextual. Right? Um, so opportunity range is not so simply defined by biological function. This is much too crude of a narrative. Okay? So once we complicate the relationship between normal opportunity range and normal species functioning, it becomes clear that we cannot merely point to a normal species function as the bright line for the boundaries of the morally acceptable use of PGD. Okay? So it may be that there are many biological variations of function that lead to a normal, or it, that lead to, um, if not a normal, at least an acceptable opportunity range within various social contexts. Okay? So if indeed um, we are appropriately, uh, uh, indeed if we appropriately accommodate people with modifications of the physical and social environment, there are multiple modes of functioning that offer access to similar important opportunities. Okay? However, uh, pluralism is not the same thing as nihilism. Right? Sort of arguing that there are uh, different modes of functioning that uh, one can, can have that can be accommodated doesn't mean that you know, any old thing will, will do for an acceptable opportunity range. Right? Um, my claim that many modes of functioning can still allow for a plenty broad complement of life opportunities should not be conflated with the claim that any mode of functioning will do this. Okay? So at the risk of being divisive within disability identity politics, this was sort of the part that made me nervous when they told me this was going to go online and you know, with, with YouTube, um, I think it should be acknowledged that there are some disabilities that will not allow for an acceptable range of opportunity regardless of the social contexts um, they're embedded within, okay? Um, and that we should avoid when implanting uh, embryos with PGD. So it is true that the societal stigmas perpetuating myths about life with a disability being unavoidably tragic warp most people's judgment about whether a given disability will allow for an acceptable range of opportunity, right? There's a lot of false information about there, uh, out there about uh, the impact of disability and quality of life. Um, there is evidence that such stigmas cause non-disabled people to consistently evaluate life with a disability as much more dismal than how that life is actually experienced by a disabled person. Okay? This is reason for us to be very cautious in making these sorts of judgments and to make them based on the carefully considered lived experiences of people with disability that we are evaluating. Right? We don't want to just sort of say, okay, well, you're obviously miserable, just look at you. Right? Um, so, however, it does not follow that every disability allows for a life in which a person can access a sufficiently broad range of life opportunities, right? <coughs> so, I believe that we can turn to one of the central concepts of the Americans with Disabilities Act to provide a guide that will parse between modes of function that lead to an acceptable range of opportunities if embedded in the appropriate social structures and those modes of function that should never deliberately be sought with PGD because they will severely limit a person's life prospects uh, in any possible social arrangement. Okay? This distinction can be drawn with uh, this concept of reasonable accommodation. Okay? So the reason is that this concept of reasonable accommodation can help us answer the question of how we might distinguish between social and biological limits to the range of life opportunities. Okay? This is precisely the function that the concept of reasonable accommodation plays in the Americans with Disabilities Act itself. Okay? As the law addresses employment opportunities for disabled people, reasonable accommodation makes this distinction. Okay? Um, so indeed, the ADA does not assume that all people with disabilities will be qualified for and capable of performing all jobs even with accommodations, right? Um, in fact, the very term reasonable accommodation signifies the rejection of this claim, okay? Employers are not required to provide every accommodation, but rather the reasonable ones, right? Um, where the ADA draws the line at what is reasonable may be ambiguous sometimes, right? Um, but there are some clear cases out there, right? 
Um, certainly, the Detroit Pistons are not required to find a way for Stephen Hawking to play a starting center, right? And the Yellow Cab isn't required to accommodate and hire Stevie Wonder as a taxi driver, right? Um, I believe the concept of reasonable accommodation can be used to get clear on which limits to opportunity are biologically inevitable and which are matters of socially constructed discriminatory barriers, okay? But again, we want to be real careful here. Um, with this distinction in mind, progress can be made toward understanding which modes of function allow for an acceptable range of life opportunities and which do not, okay? So, one might object that it is morally wrong to implant an embryo with any sort of impairment, right? On the grounds that there are some opportunities that will be closed off from the future being with that impairment, right? Um, so, you know, this is, this is the objection that, well, we don't want to implant a blind embryo because it won't be able to drive a cab someday, right? Um, this objection rests on the premise that every person deserves access to the full range of all possible life opportunities. And this is called the open future argument in the literature, okay? So, after all, a deaf person may be accommodated so that their deafness does not decrease their social status, but they will never have the opportunity to enjoy Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, right? There will be some opportunities that are closed off from people because of disability, right? Um, in response to this, um, Jackie Leach Scully observes that uh, this sort of idea of an open future is kind of a myth, right? Um, no child has access to the full range of all possible life opportunities, right? Because all parents make decisions about the form and content of a child's life from the moment it is born, and really often before, um, including the education exists, the company it keeps. We understand that no child can survive, let alone flourish, in the absence of familial and social framework that guides its development, and inevitably, in doing so, restricts some choices and behaviors, right? That is what it means to parent, is to sort of narrow the, the otherwise open future of a, of a child, okay? So as Scully observes, a large part of the project of parenting is constituted by adjudicating trade-offs between different possible life opportunities your child will someday have access to, okay? So the upshot of Scully's reply to the open future argument is that there is no Archimedean point from which to define normal or equal opportunity range because everyone has a limited range of opportunities from which to choose from, okay? Um, the best we can hope for is to delineate, uh, delineate an acceptable range of opportunity for our future children with the choices we make on their behalf, okay? So we can't sort of say, okay, well, we want this normal opportunity range by um, having this completely open future because that just doesn't happen for anybody. Um, and so why pick on the disabled folk, right? Um, so at this point, it is important to remember that we have already established a prima facie decisional authority for parents over the fate of their future children, okay? The notion of an acceptable opportunity range as adjusted by the concept of reasonable accommodation is meant only to be a limiting concept that restricts the otherwise presumed authority of parents to make decisions about the use of PGD. So all this boundary really needs to do is help us pick out cases in which parents are making choices that inevitably and severely diminish the scope and quality of a future child's opportunity range, regardless of mitigating social context, okay? <coughs> Some examples, I think, would be informative at this point, okay? One might imagine a couple, and this is kind of close to my heart because being a little person, obviously, um, one might imagine a couple who both have a chondroplasia needing to use IVF to successfully achieve pregnancy and thus deciding to take the next small step to use PGD to select an embryo with a chondroplasia, right? Um, these potential parents have presumptive authority to do this because they care about their future child, understand the cultural and physical environment in which it will exist as a person with dwarfism, and have some legitimate interests in how that child will be raised, right? It sort of meets that trifecta of, of, of prima facie reasons. Um, in their judgment, any restriction to opportunity range posed by a chondroplasia will be balanced 
by improvement in the infant's care, resulting from it not quickly outgrowing them and sharing some of the most fundamental aspects of their life experiences. Okay. Um, while a chondroplasia would in inevitably eliminate some opportunities from a potential child's supposedly open future, right? It's not just Stephen Hawking that won't be able to play center for the Detroit Pistons, right? Um, it does not seem that this is the sort of disability that restricts function to the point that many or most important life opportunities would be eliminated after adjustment with reasonable accommodations, right? Okay, so in contrast to this example, right, I'll borrow another example um, that um, uh, is, is uh, possible within the dwarfism community, right? Not to pick on other disabilities that I don't experience, right? So in contrast, the standard of reasonable accommodation would restrict that same couple from deliberately implanting an embryo that has two copies of the dominant achondroplasia gene because double dominance leads to a very attenuated life filled with profound physical pain and suffering from start to finish, right? Um, basically, um, this is sort of the reason why I, uh, I wrote this paper, right? In that um, the way the Mendelian square sort of sets up for two people that have achondroplasia, right, there's a 25% chance that your child will die if you have um, a, a, a child sort of the old-fashioned way, right? Um, which is a pretty high likelihood, right? <laughs> so no reasonable accommodation can be used to mitigate these se severe impairments in a way that would leave such an infant with any prospect of accessing even the most basic sorts of life opportunities because of this certainty of a very early death, right? This is sort of one of those disabilities, um, and, and whether or not to call it a disability is kind of controversial, um, but, I, but I kind of am, am going to use that term real broadly here. Um, but it's one of those sort of disabilities that can't be reasonably accommodated, right? And so it wouldn't meet um, the, the boundary criteria that I'm, that I'm talking about. So admittedly, these examples are probably too easy, right? Many cases will challenge our intu intuitions of what accommodations are reasonable and what range of opportunity is acceptable, right? Um, we must account for our limited imagination, though, I think, um, for what is possible when accommodating people with disabilities, um, usually erring on the, side, on the side of judgment of potential parents themselves, especially when they themselves have experienced the sort of life they wish to impart in their future children, okay? Um, and so I think that that's kind of relevant here, right? I mean, if you use the example of uh, the, the two people with achondroplasia, um, deliberately implanting a child with achondroplasia. They've experienced that. They know what it's like, right? Whereas they don't know what it's like to implant a child with double dominant achondroplasia. They haven't experienced that, okay? So that sort of helps us along with trying to think this through, I think. So um, the next section of the paper, okay, um, deals with some possible sort of objections to my position and sort of looks at other um, positions, the, the two that I sort of started off the paper with. Um, on, on the opposite ends of the spectrum, okay? Um, so first we're gonna start with this uh, laissez-faire eugenics, right? Um, so this section is titled, Accounting for Laissez-faire Eugenics and the Disability Critique of Embryo Selection, right? Um, there's a huge literature um, within disability studies and disability bioethics that is real critical of using um, PGDE and prenatal diagnosis in general, right? And so what I'm doing here is kind of controversial to say, okay, well, yeah, we should use it, right? Um, <coughs> and so um, I want to try to argue that my position is actually um, uh, pretty friendly to that critique in many ways, okay? So it should be clear, I hope, that my position is not an endorsement of the sort of laissez-faire eugenics feared by David King uh, in the article cited above, right? My argument does not endorse reproductive freedom only in as far as it would reduce the incidence of genetically transmitted disabilities, right? Um, as King argues is the motivation and the outcome of PGD programs, okay? <laughs> Clearly in some cases my position would even justify the permissibility of allowing prospective parents to deliberately produce a disabled child, which is kind of the opposite of laissez-faire eugenics, right? Um, so it doesn't seem that the sorts of tight regulation of PGD that King promotes would be justifiably leveled against the expansion of PGD that this paper kind of is endorsing, right? 
But I'm honestly not all that concerned with King's arguments. Um, many disability studies scholars, however, um, and disability rights activists strongly object to the unreflective use of prenatal diagnosis and selection, including PGD, because of the way in which it has the potential to express, reinforce, and encourage harmful social stigmas toward disabled people. Okay, this is sometimes recall. Uh, this is sometimes called the expressivist argument. Okay, at first blush, blush, my position seems to be at odds with some of these most uh, prominent of these arguments. Okay, most notably, Adrian Ash developed her very sophisticated critique of prenatal diagnosi diagnosis and selection for more than twenty years. Okay, with David Wasserman, a uh, Ash recently argued that prenatal diagnosis and selection against disability is deeply morally troubling because it encourages the discriminatory practice of, and this is one of these words that I have a hard time with, please excuse me, synecdoche, okay, um, which is defined as, quote, not the literary device in which the part stands for the whole, but the characteristic response to a stigmatized trait in which the part obscures or effaces the whole. Okay, so Ash and Wasserman argue that this cognitive process of synecdoche is at the core of common practices of unjustified discrimination in general, right? And that every time a person is denied housing, employment, access to public service, or participation in the political process, merely because of a stigmatized characteristic like disability, race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, they have been judged as a whole based on a single irrelevant characteristic. Okay? So this is just sort of how discrimination works in general according to Ash and Washerman. Okay? So they maintain that selecting non-disabled embryos and fetuses with PGD or selective abortion relies on this exact same kind of logic. Um, and hence should be faced with the same sort of moral indignation as these other commonly condemned practices. Right? You are um, obscuring the whole by overly emphasizing sort of this one characteristic, okay? <coughs> How am I on time? Okay. I'm getting there. <coughs> However much my position seems to have in common, common with Ash and Wasserman's refutation of the idea that equality of opportunity is inevitably conditioned on a narrow range of normal function, they go on to argue that deliberately selecting a disabled embryo with PGD would also be synecdotal um, and ought to be rejected. Using the example of a deaf couple that desires to have a child like themselves, Ash and Wasserman claim selecting for deaf deafness is just as synecdotal as selecting against it, in our view, because it assumes that intimacy and community can be achieved only through one shared characteristic. Okay, so this is a pretty strong objection. On its face, this seems like a flawed argument because Ash and Wasser's um, definition of synecdoche um, requires that the trait being chosen against must be one that is stigmatized, right? And so um, you can't really say, I don't think, that um, it's, it's the same to select for a disability as against because the whole argument hinges on the stigma surrounding that one trait that's exaggerated, okay? So they seem to highlight this distinction between synecdochal reasoning that is based on stigma and other sorts of preference-based choice with the analogy to marriage. We recognize some moral difference between a Jew who would date or marry only another Jew and a Jew who would date or marry a white Christian, but not a black of any faith, because those who restrict themselves to their own kind and those who exclude only certain other kinds, um, the former attitude may be insular or clannish, but it need not offend in the same way as the latter, because it need not convey disrespect, right? Um, being hearing is not a widely stigmatized trait, and so it may seem that a deaf couple selecting a deaf embryo might be understood as insular and clannish in the same way, right? Rather than synecdotal or synecdochal in this strict sense. Um, however, I am I'm inclined to read Ash and Wasserman more charitably on this issue, actually, um, and suggest that selecting against hearing embryos could be based on synecdochal reasoning if deaf parents are making the decision within the context 
of a deaf culture that stigmatizes the trait of hearing within the boundaries of that culture, right? Um, admittedly, I do not know enough about deaf culture to know if that's ever the case, right? Um, I, I'm not sure if it's exactly right to sort of say that hearing is stigmatized within deaf culture, um, but it seems at least possible, right? <laughs> so I do not think that there is a way really to make my position on PGD and reproductive freedom completely philosophically consistent with this critique. However, I do not think my arguments categorically reject the fundamental goals of that critique, what it's trying to do, right? Um, Ash Wasserman and the vast majority of disability activists and scholars are not calling for some sort of legal ban on prenatal diagnosis and selective abortion or, or uh, implantation, right? Rather, they're providing a moral analysis of the practice that is meant to, quote, sensitize people to the moral problems of impairment screening, okay? So I believe my arguments divorcing the concepts of species normal functioning and acceptable opportunity range and deploying the to tool of reasonable accommodation when thinking about a child's future um, life chances are very much in line with what they're trying to do, okay? This is because my position challenges prospective parents and healthcare providers to think critically and with nuance about how impairment always exists within the specific social context um, when disability appears in a person's lived experience, okay? I hope it is clear that my position is not one that would embrace a mechanical reproductive decision-making grounded in unexamined stigma and stereotype like Wasserman and Ash are afraid of. So in addition to, be in addition to being compatible with the stated goals of Ash's critique, I believe that my position is very much congruent with the specific policy suggestions made by Ash and others in the disability community to reduce reproductive decision making grounded in social stigma and stereotype, okay? Namely, Ash has repeatedly argued for changes in the practices of genetic counseling that would improve the quality and accuracy of information about disability delivered to potential mothers through the counseling process, okay? Turning to the, it's the influence exerted on reproductive decisions by the ironically named non-directive counseling, Ash and Geller argued as early as 1996 that, quote, the most important problems with the communication of genetic information stem from the content of the material and the style of disclosure, especially when the material conveys a traditional biases about disability, focuses simply on medical characteristics and probabilities, and includes woefully little about the lives of people with disabilities for which these tests are available, okay? So the idea that synecdocal reproductive decision-making based on stigma-laden stereotype can be reduced by providing parents with a richer account of life with a disability than what is available in popular stereotypes um, and medicine's physiological descriptions, okay? And that's kind of what I'm trying to do here, right? Um, specific policies have been developed to achieve this end. Um, there's something called the prenatal, Prenatally and Postnatally Diagnosed Conditions Awareness Act, um, more widely known as the Kennedy-Brownback Bill, um, for its original two co-sponsors in the U.S. Senate. Now, Kennedy and Brownback, I, I don't know if you guys uh, are familiar with, um, they're no longer in the Senate, of course, um, but um, those are strange bedfellows, right? Um, the act was intended to reduce what Ash would call synecdocal decision-making by improving the breadth and accuracy of information available to parents who are using prenatal diagnosis, right? Its key components were to establish a hotline um, that parents could call um, with genetic disabilities, collect evidence-based information about genetic disabilities, expand the networks of peer support and outreach um, for parents of children with uh, genetic disabilities and establish um, disability awareness educational programs for genetic counselors so that they know more about life with disability um, in sort of its social contexts, right? Um, so I see no reason why my position that justifies parental authority to choose a future child's mode of function through PGD would be antagonistic toward these provisions of this law, right? Um, in fact, I, I would argue that all of the components of this law um, would dovetail quite nicely with my suggestion that parents and medical providers who interpreted the, the boundaries of an acceptable opportunity range 
for their future children by thinking through a given mode of function that has been accommodated reasonably. Okay? All of the policy mechanisms mentioned above could be used by parents and providers who are trying to learn more about the lived experience of the given disability and how it might have an impact in one's opportunity range in different possible contexts and environments. Okay? Um, what are we doing with time? I think I'm going to stop now um, to allow for some questions. Does that sound reasonable? Um, I, I go on to yeah, sort of, yeah, yeah I, I go on to critique Savalescu and sort of do more of that. Um, but I don't know that that's really necessary just because I've already sort of done my thing with Norm Daniels and it's kind of similar. So. So, so first of all, like, thank you, Joe, for a great paper. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna run.